Good morning. It's a gift to be with you all today. Um, let's pray before you open up God's word. Lord, we come before you today in humility, knowing that apart from your Holy Spirit, we can't hear your word rightly and we can't respond. By your spirit, would you open up our eyes and open up our hearts that we might see your will in our lives, that you might bring comfort where there is grief, conviction where there's complacency. Lord, do a work that only you can do by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we've been in the book of Romans now for the entirety of 2024. And we've hit what uh, most people would say is the big shift in the book. Romans chapter, we're having some technical issues with our lights here. All right. Well, let's just hope we keep the power. If not, I'll just talk really loud. Um, Romans 1 through 8 is probably the part of the book that if you were to like, you know, if, if this were an actual book apart from your Bible on your shelf, Romans 1 through 8 would probably have a bunch of wear and tear on it, right? A bunch of wrinkles on those pages, a bunch of underlining, maybe a few tears here or there. Why? Because Romans 1 through 8, when we think of the book of Romans, that's what we think of. This great exposition of the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone. That our God justifies us, meaning he makes us right with him so that we can re-enter life with him as a pure act of grace. That his son willingly takes our death upon himself, our guilt upon himself, so that it is no longer ours, so there's nothing to, to make us judged. But not only that, he also lived a perfectly righteous life in our place, what's called the active obedience of Christ. So that when we are united to him by the spirit, we are clothed in his perfect righteousness. What is all of this about? It's all about how God, by his grace, brought us back into life with him. Justification is not simply a legal category. It's a relational category in which God brings us near to himself. And so we really enjoy this part of the book if we read it at all. It's the section that we say, if there's ever been a clearer understanding of how we are saved, it's Romans 1 through 8. But then something interesting happens. If you were to give, you know, a, a, an outline of the book of Romans, it would look something like this. Romans 1 through 8, right? How God brings us near to him through justification. Romans 9 through 11. Uh, something weird about Israel. Not really sure. Like Israel's lost, but not, but is, but isn't. And there's still hope for Israel, but only through the Messiah. I'm not really sure what that's all about. Chapters 12 through 16, oh, thank God that's over. We're in the doctrine of sanctification, right? Doctrine of salvation, who knows? Doctrine of sanctification, book of Romans, right? But my hope is that for the next few weeks, I can help open up Romans 9 through 11 for you, because many of us have heard so many different interpretations of this, especially because in America, the theological movement called dispensationalism is, uh, whether we realize it or not, many people's working theological assumption on how the Bible fits together, but is a very new and novel theological position. But I'm not even going to get into that. What I want to do today is just communicate this, and for the next three chapters, Paul shows us what we do when God's people go astray. And he shows us that we don't feel like we are better than them, that we don't treat them with indignation, and we don't reject them. Rather, Paul saw God's people go astray. They missed the Messiah when he arrived. And how does he respond? He grieves because he maintains a heart of love for God's people. He grieves and maintains a heart of love for God's people. If anybody suffered at the hands of people that were formerly part of God's people, it was Paul. 
He lost all of his relational capital, his financial capital, everything to follow the Messiah. And yet his heart is so open to them. He says, I would be cut off myself just so that you might be brought into life with God. But then what we have is the rest of chapter 29 is not an exposition on the doctrine of double predestination, right? God chooses some, hardens others. I don't think that's actually what Paul is trying to communicate here. Rather, what he is doing in chapters 1 through 29 is he is retelling the story of Israel. And what is he showing? God has mercy on whom he has mercy. He can do a work nobody expects. He will lovingly choose those he chooses to lovingly choose. And what does that mean? That while God's people are in the moment, have gone astray, there is always hope that there can be an outpouring of his spirit yet again. This is the God who established his people in mercy. And what we see in Romans chapter 11, two chapters later, is Paul's great hope that mercy will be extended yet again. This is a word of hope for God's people, Israel, that there can yet again be an outpouring of the Spirit and they be brought into life with the Messiah. So if you would, turn with me to Romans 9, 1 through 5, and we're actually going to go all the way through chapter 29 today because we need to see it. But what I want to do today is just look at two things because I actually think And I I shared this with you last week. This passage is incredibly uh, applicable to this moment in the church. With so much apostasy going on, how do we respond to those who have walked away? With grief and love and hope. So if you would, turn with me in this text, please. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul begins this section in kind of a weird way. He he says, you know, I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. You know, if you could like, you know, one of the headings, if it said real talk, right? Real talk for a second. He can't bear it. He can't bear the reality that God's people are no longer following God. That God's people are cut off from the promises of God as they've rejected the Messiah. The very people who are cut off from the world and engrafted into God through circumcision, he's saying, I myself would be cut off for them to be brought back into life. His heart, you can just see it. There's tears on this section of Romans. Those who were adopted by God, as God's chosen in Abraham, are now wandering orphans. Those who had the glory of God go with them in the tabernacle, miss the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Those who had the covenantal promises of God, which stipulated life with God, miss their fulfillment in the Messiah himself. Those who had the law given to them miss the perfect law keeper. Those who were taught how to worship in the, Levi- in the Levitical system missed the great high priest when he arrived. Those who were given the promises of God missed the promise himself. They missed the Messiah. And what we see in, in the Apostle Paul is not a heart of judgment. It's not a heart of rejection. It's not saying, well, you were given all of the blessings, All of the perks, if anyone should have seen it, it was you and you missed it. He's not saying that. It's not a word of judgment. Rather, when we see those that were once a part of the people of God walk away from God and his people, what is the only proper response? Sorrow and grief. His heart is still open to them. And all he wants is for them to come home. 
You know, last week I shared with you the startling statistics about the great de-churching that's happening in the United States today. But because it was Labor Day weekend and over half of you were gone, I think it'd be good to, to retell it. Uh, Michael Graham and Jim Davis in their book, The Great Dechurching, have documented that roughly 40 million Americans over the past 25 years have left the church. Just to put that into some context, that's 16% of the general population, and it reveals the single greatest theological movement in the history of the United States. We often think about a movement of the Spirit, a movement of God as the church grows. We remember things like the First Great Awakening. Christianity grew in America from 10 to 17%. Now think about that for a minute, right? Only 10% of colonial America went to church, and then 17% did. We often think everybody went to church back then. Well, it turns out they didn't. During the Second Great Awakening, all the way up to the Civil War, these are people like Wesley and in Whitfield and Finney, the great revivals of that era of the Second Great Awakening went from 17% to 34% of the population. Overwhelming growth in the Christian church. Think about that for a minute. It doubled in under a century. But then this is the one that we don't even have a category for. It's interesting. We, we talk about the first Great Awakening. We talk about the second Great Awakening. But actually, the greatest outpouring of the Spirit that brought forth conversions, and I haven't done enough research in it to understand why, is, was actually after the Civil War, in which religious adherence in the United States went up from 13.5 million people to 32.7. It's more than, uh, well, nearly, more than doubled with a net increase of 12% of the total population. And what we see happening in the past 25 years is a greater de-churching than the first and second Great Awakening combined, plus all of the conversions that happened after the Civil War. Now, Davis and Graham point out that many of these people haven't actually Uh, rejected Jesus. They've just rejected the church. And he also gives us hope that many of them are willing to come back. But what we do see is that there is an overwhelming trend of a movement away from the people of God. And what we know sociologically speaking is if once you become alienated from the people of God, even if you say, I'm still a person of God, that will not be handed on to your children and will absolutely not be handed on to your grandchildren. So we are seeing the greatest shift in religious adherence in the history of the United States. And many of us are facing that pain in our lives today. Many of us have children that have walked away from the faith. And our hearts resonate with Paul's words here. I'd be cut off myself just to bring you home. I know many of you feel that pain. I know many of you ask that question, what what went wrong here? What could I have done differently here? You tried to raise your children in the faith. You brought them to church. You were imperfect, but you did the best that you could. And your heart is an open wound as you see your children walk away from the faith. Many of us have had friends or brothers and sisters, even spouses, who have walked away. And I have to admit, in my own life, uh, this is seriously marked Uh, how I have gone about the process of ministry. And frankly, if you really want to know why we invest most of our budget in our children, it's because of this. The only way to engage this problem is to actually look at the future. But it's also because in my own life, so many of my friends, people I thought I was going to do ministry with for the rest of my life, people I went to seminary with, people I was ordained with in the Anglican church, what marked the beginning of my ministry was apostasy amongst people that I trusted and people that I thought would be with me the rest of my life. And I have to admit, my response wasn't like Paul's. Mine was more oriented towards an ungodly sense of anger and disgust, more akin to the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son than the heart of Jesus. My response can often be, well, what made them go wrong? What patterns of behavior shifted there? So I'm just going to get as far away from that as possible. Or to look at them with disgust and say, how could you be so gullible 
that you think you're being brave and all you are doing is proudly marching out of the church into the applause of the world. You're the least brave person in the room. But it's ungodly. It's not the heart of Paul. And it's not the heart of Jesus. When we look at our loved ones leaving the faith, our response shouldn't be a personal sense of betrayal. Because it's not about you. It's a heart of grief and a heart of love, longing for them to come home. Here's a word that I think we need to hear as a church, because I'm worried I'm seeing this happening. In a hardening world, the church doesn't need to harden, right? This is so many responses that we're seeing in the church today. How do we stand up against the world? We stand up against the world. But what is the heart that we see of Paul here? What is the heart of Jesus? In a hardening world, the church actually needs to grow even softer in their hearts toward the world. Paul literally says here, I would be cut off myself just to bring you home. Is that the heart that we have for those in our lives that we feel betrayed by, we feel left by? To look at them in love and to long for them to come home to Jesus. So first, Paul shows us this image of how do we respond to apostasy in the church? Is it anger? No. No. It's a soft heart of grief and of love. But then Paul does something else here. He then goes off into this story all about the story of Israel. All the way through, he covers this great narrative of the story of Israel. Why? Because he also wants to anchor us in hope. That while there is a hardening of Israel in this moment, what we're going to see way out in chapter 11, I wish I could just preach it as one text today and I just can't. There's this hope that there will be a revival in Israel. There will be a reawakening of the spirit amongst the people of God, and they will be restored into life. There is a hopefulness that is ahead, not a hardening. And so what Paul does here is he retells the whole story of Israel. And what does he show? That from beginning to end, God is merciful on whom he is merciful, and he chooses those that we least expect. And so the question begins to arise, can he do it again? Can he show forth mercy again? When we look at the church around us, we say it's in decline. What church will our children inherit? How does Paul respond? He says, look at what God has been doing the whole time. He's been doing the unexpected to raise his people out of ashes into life. Can he do it again? Let's look at our text. And again, I don't want to sidestep these. These are some of the most perplexing texts in all of Holy Scripture. But what I want to do is show you they serve a purpose for a bigger argument. And the argument is not double predestination. The argument is an out, hopeful outpouring of the Spirit upon Israel yet again. Look at verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God had failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather, Isaac, though they were not yet born and had had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's promise of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What do we see here? We see some of the most explicit teaching (laughs) Salvation is not grounded in how good we are, but purely in the grace of God. We see that Sarah had a barren womb, and yet God brought forth resurrection life. We see that God chose to love Jacob instead of Esau. And Jacob is this great image of us of what? That from beginning to end, 
Jacob's status before God was entirely contingent upon God's choice to love him. Because what do we see all throughout the life of Jacob? He was the man who stumbled again and again, and God raised him up time and time again. It is a story from beginning to end that God shows mercy upon whom he shows mercy. And what is Paul trying to do here? The question arises, can he do it again? Israel has stumbled. Israel has missed the Messiah. Can he raise them back? Look at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You know, we tend to fixate on the question, does God make Pharaoh sin and, and is that just and is that possible? I'd like just as a brief aside, 1 Timothy 2, 4 is also in the Bible, right? This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the, to the knowledge of the truth. That makes that rather perplexing, doesn't it? These are what uh, some would call the dual affirmations of Holy Scripture. That God chooses some and passes over some, and yet he loves all. How do we understand that? I think that the history of the church has shown us that it will always remain outside of our grasp. And yet... What point is Paul trying to make here? Is that the primary point he's making? No. The point he is making is that he zoomed in on a point of Israel's history where everything appeared to be lost, where everything appeared to be out of control, where there was one man who seemed to be sovereign and in power, Pharaoh, and he had them captured and captivated, and they couldn't escape. And so what is Paul saying here? Even there, God is in control. Even there, God is sovereign. Even over the most powerful man on the planet, he only looks to be that way. But even over him, God is utterly sovereign. And in this situation where Israel, it appears that all hope is lost, God brought forth life. And the question arises yet again, could God do it again? Look at verse 19. You will say to them then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, had endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews but only, but also from the Gentiles? As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not who is not beloved, I will call beloved. You know, we fixate on God's wrath in the question of justice, but Paul says here, what if that wrath is just an opportunity to show God's greater mercy? What if this moment where Israel is entirely lost is there to reveal the overabounding love of God to call them home? What if this moment of decline in the church is a great pruning that we are seeing? And a pruning never feels good. It always feels like death. But what if God is doing it in order to bring forth far greater life ahead? I've said this before, and I will say it again. I'm far more confident in the church our children will lead than in the one that we have led. What if? What if he is preparing for an outpouring of the Spirit? What if there is a movement of renewal that we have yet to see? What if we began to pray diligently 
that our children were to be a people of revival, a people of obedience that would bring forth life. He's done it before. Can he do it again? Now let's conclude. Look at verse 26. And in this very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. God again and again shows his merciful power in the small things and in the insignificant, in remnants and not armies. Paul here is pointing to this great hope that there will be a remnant of Israel that is preserved and saved. And out of that remnant, God's grace would pour forth. I cannot help but wonder if Romans 9 through 11 will become closer to our hearts in the coming years. As we see the church declining around us, I am seeing a tendency in the church that says what we should do is harden ourselves to protect ourselves. But what does the Apostle Paul show here? He shows that we must maintain soft hearts to the lost and to those that have left. And we hold out hope, not in the power of men, not in the power of women, but in the power of God to bring forth renewal and revival in his people because he has done it before and he can do it again. Next Sunday, uh, I, uh, we are going to host a prayer service at three o'clock here, and I want to invite all of you to join us. I want to invite you especially If you have had someone in your life who is very near to you and very dear to you, who has walked away from the faith. And we're going to spend a few hours praying. To pray for revival, to pray for repentance. To pray the words of Jesus, that our God is the kind of God to leave the 99 and go find the one lost sheep. And my prayer for you is that you wouldn't give up hope that your heart wouldn't turn to bitterness, but your hearts would remain soft and cry out to the one who can bring lost sheep home, our good shepherd. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for those in our lives who have wandered far from you. Would you be merciful, Lord, to bring them home? Lord, would you soften our hearts that they wouldn't be hardened, they wouldn't be bitter, or they wouldn't give up hope, but that they would long for the outpouring of your gracious Holy Spirit to bring forth life in your people. Lord, we continue to await the day when your revival will break out amongst the Jews. Lord, we pray for an outpouring of missional fervor for them, love for them, and a revival within them that they might see the Messiah and turn to him in faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.